Welcome to Tea with Tolkien, a community for the Hobbit at heart. Join us as we celebrate the works, life, and faith of J.R.R. Tolkien. We invite you to pull up a cozy chair and join us as we dive deeper into The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, The Silmarillion, and beyond. Today we're chatting about the Amazon Prime series, The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, and why I think the infamous Mithril origin story is a lie of Sauron. All right, so today we are going to be talking about the Rings of Power TV series. I know that it's been a while since season one came out, but I have not stopped thinking about it. And as season two is going to be coming out later this year, hopefully in the fall, I wanted to share some analysis that I have been kind of mulling over for the last 18 months, to be honest, and kind of working through it. And I think that... If I'm right, I will be super, 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 super happy with the series writers and the showrunners. I have gotten pretty attached to my theories at this point, which I think is probably one of the biggest issues with creating such a long gap in between seasons. Like I have spent such a very long time thinking about how to make this season make sense. And so now if it turns out that I'm wrong, I'll be a little bit bummed out. However, I have had a lot of fun discussing this season with all sorts of people online over the last year or so. And so today I wanted to share kind of like the culmination of my thoughts on The Rings of Power season one. This isn't a review. I already published my review about a year ago, but I wanted to share something that's a little bit more of an in-depth analysis of the season. And I'm going to be calling it The Rings of Power, A Tale of Three Alloys. I want to preface this by saying I did think there could have been a fourth alloy, but the number three kind of goes pretty nicely, and the fourth alloy is kind of not the strongest example. So I nailed it down to three alloys, and let's get started. Now this video contains spoilers, as you might have guessed, for season one of The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power. It's also a discussion of the series as it stands on its own, although I will be using Tolkien's texts when I think it's necessary to kind of support my thoughts on what they're doing with characterization. So while elements of Tolkien's lore definitely add a lot of depth to the stories that we see on screen, this is just a blanket statement that the series itself is not canonical or authoritative, and no matter what happens with the Rings of Power, we still have the books. You can read more of my thoughts on the distinctions between the series and Tolkien's Legendarium on my website, and I will add a link to that in the show notes. So at the core of season one of The Rings of Power lies this idea of an alloy. They get, they kind of introduce it in a a little bit of a goofy way, where we see in episode eight, Halbrand is wandering around in his pajamas in Celebrimbor's Forge. And he stumbles upon this little table where all of the jewels are sitting that they're going to use for forging. There's a conversation happening between Halbrand, who is Sauron, and Celebrimbor. Sauron introduces the great smith Celebrimbor to the idea of an alloy, which I think what they were trying to do with this is drive home the sort of allegory that they were trying to create. Because as we'll see in this video, the idea of an alloy is like the whole idea of this series. So the concept of an alloy, as we can understand it within the series, is you've got two opposing forces and they have been brought together. In their union, they complement one another, they strengthen one another, and they create something new. So you've got so you've got some light, you've got some darkness, you bring them together, and somehow they create a new force of sorts. In an interview with Vanity Fair after the finale, Patrick McKay and J.D. Payne sat down and they spoke a little bit about the whole idea of alloys. So I'm going to read some of their quotes. Patrick McKay, the title of this episode is Alloyed, and there's a rich metaphor there of things that don't belong together being coaxed together and complementing one another and balancing one another. That's very much what's going on emotionally with Galadriel and Sauron. That's his pitch. If you and me do this together, you'll balance my dark side, and I'll give you the power that nobody wants to give you. He's pitching an alloy to her, and that's what is happening with the rings. 
Now J.D. Payne chimes in and he says, even the mithril itself, we're saying, is a certain kind of alloy because we tell this potentially apocryphal backstory about it. Whether people want to treat it as canon or not, it's this struggle between good and evil that was fused together in a moment of lightning. So even mithril has this sort of duality to it as well. Okay, so in this quote, they highlighted three alloys at work in season one. This video is going to explore each of these alloys in light of the season as a whole, but most importantly, we are going to take a careful look at the apocryphal mithril origin story, which I argue is actually a lie of Sauron. So the three alloys of season one are mithril, which is the product, apparently, of good and evil. And then we have the raft, which is involving Sauron and Galadriel. And then we have the rings, which are forged between Sauron and Celebrimbor. Here, I am going to analyze perhaps the most puzzling, puzzling is the nicest way I can think of putting it, aspect of season one. We've been calling it Smithril, which is the Silmaril Mithril Unification Theory. When you take this at face value, uh, this tale really creates the impression that the showrunners just don't understand Tolkien's philosophy concerning evil, and they've also taken this massive liberty in creating their own origin story for this lore. It's a very bold choice, and I think it was a big risk for them. So I'm hoping, hoping, hoping that this risk will pay off in some sort of revelation that this is all a lie, and you're probably going to hear me say that a lot. So if it does turn out that this song is later revealed as a lie of Sauron, I'm going to be super, super happy. I will be telling everyone I told you so. But um, if this story is actually meant to be true in-universe, I'm going to be a little bit bummed out. But for the time being, let's just suspend all disbelief and move forward under the assumption that this is a Sauronic lie. Before we get too far into the video, I want to express some feelings, I guess, um, towards the season as a whole. While I've really enjoyed theorizing about the Rings of Power, I think that these theories and kind of insights would have been a lot easier to come by if the season had been a bit longer. I think we know that it should have been 10 episodes. It was written as 10 episodes, but then later on, for one reason or another, it was cut down to eight. A lot of stuff was lost in editing, and I think the story suffered dearly because of it. There are a lot of things in the season that are just downright confusing and don't make sense. And it kind of hurts to know that hopefully this series, this season would have made a lot more sense had we been given enough room to breathe with the story. I think it's like deeply frustrating. <laughs> However, there are also a lot of unprecedented circumstances going around during season one, especially with the pandemic, which shut down the entire world. And that was kind of a completely unforeseen obstacle, as well as the late stage recasting of the actor who played Celebrimbor. So with all of that said, I am willing to give the season a lot of grace. However, because of it and because of how confusing in a lot of ways season one was, my expectations for season two are a lot higher. And if I have to spend the next two years theorizing about season two in the way that I have about season one, I'm probably not going to be super happy about that. So let's talk about the Song of the Roots of the Hithigler. This is the apocryphal origin story from Mithril, which is detailed in episode 5 of season 1 of The Rings of Power, in conversation between Elrond and Gilgalad. It speaks of a battle, high among the peaks of the Misty Mountains, not over honor or duty, but over a tree, within which some claim was hidden the last of the lost Silmarils. On one side fought an elven warrior, with a heart as pure as Monwe, who poured all of his light into the tree to protect it. On the other, a Balrog of Morgoth, who channeled all of his hatred into the tree to destroy it. Amidst their duel unending, lightning ensnared the tree, forging of their conflict a power. A power as pure and light as good, as strong and unyielding as evil. They say it seeped down the roots into the mountain depths, where for centuries now it has awaited. According to the showrunners, this myth was created to unify the various tales of the legendarium, from the trees of Valinor to the Silmarils, all the way to the rings themselves. In an interview with Vulture, J.D. Payne says, We knew the rings needed to have a special power to them. Some of that could be in what Sauron inculcates from the unseen world, and what Celebrimbor is able to do in terms of beauty. But we thought it could be interesting to play with the kind of power they have. 
What if there is a grand unification theory that could connect the light of the trees of Valinor, which went into the Silmarils, to the rings? The three elven rings were at least partially made of mithril. What if there's something in mithril that could connect to the Silmarils? What if the Silmaril that went into the earth was connected through the roots of a tree that could become mithril? It was a way to connect many parts of the canon, including the elves fading, in a way that incorporated other parts of the legendarium. However, in the same interview, it's also emphasized that this tale is considered apocryphal. If you don't know what apocryphal means, it would be something that is of doubtful authenticity, although widely circulated as being true. So Elrond himself, who is a lore master, or he is meant to be, I'm not quite sure if he's like meant to be a lore master at this point in the show, he views it as apocryphal, which means he looks on the story with doubt. So in this same interview, Patrick McKay says, but also, we know Elrond is a lore master, and he is aware of the tale. And he says in that fifth episode that it's apocryphal. I would trust his read on a piece of lore. Mithril is unusual in Middle-earth. We know from canon that Mithril is at least in one of the rings, Galadriel's ring. We felt there were possibilities to hint that maybe there's a little more to it, but maybe not. So even in these interviews, the showrunners are kind of like taking your hand and leading you towards the possibility that this is not meant to be believed as true, but they're obviously not coming out and saying it. So it's my hope that we will get some resolution in the future. Seeing the song of the roots of the Hithiglir as a lie of Sauron. Given the nature of this song and the fact that the door has been left open for doubt, it's my belief that this does not represent an in-universe truth and is instead a lie crafted by the great deceiver Sauron. One of my favorite lines from the season comes from Adar, where he says to Arondir, You have been told many lies. Some run so deep, even the rocks and roots now believe them. To untangle it all would but require the creation of a new world, and that is something only the gods can do. And I am no god, at least not yet. It's kind of watering the seeds of doubt as we're going throughout the season. There's this sense of someone is lying to us, and I think obviously the main deception at hand here is that Halbrand is Sauron, but I do think that there are more layers to it. Because the Song of the Roots of the Hithiglir is a dualistic story which misrepresents Tolkien's worldview, but perfectly represents Sauron's mind. It is my belief that Sauron has spoken to Celebrimbor long before the events of Season 1, during which he first whispered the Song of the Roots of the Hithiglir. In Tolkien's framework, evil does not exist as its own force. Rather, it is the deprivation or distortion of goodness. In Middle-earth, goodness and evil do not seek a perfect balance or collaboration. I think that's kind of what you have with the Force in the Star Wars. You have the dark side and the, the good side, but that's not how it works for Tolkien. Instead, goodness strives to resist evil. There's no balance that needs to be held. It's just, it's totally fine to try and destroy evil. The notion that I am also so sorry for referencing Star Wars because I could have gotten that wrong and I'm not as big of a Star Wars nerd as I am about Tolkien. So um, I would hope that the Star Wars nerds could be forgiving to me if I misrepresented the Star Wars um, perspective of evil. So the notion that two opposing forces might work together for the benefit of Middle-earth comes directly from the mind of Sauron, and it is seen in several ways throughout season one. Through the providence of Eru, or the One as they call him in the Rings of Power, evil deeds may be folded into the plans of fate and bring about goodness, but the evil deeds will always themselves remain evil. And that's something that is at like the core of Tolkien. So it's very important for an adaptation to nail that theme. But this idea that two forces might work together for the benefit of Middle-earth comes directly from the playbook of Sauron. And we can see this most plainly in the Silmarillion when Sauron is manipulating the Noldor. Sauron says to them, Alas for the weakness of the great, for a mighty king is Gilgalad, and wise in all lore is Master Elrond, and yet they will not aid me in my labors. Can it be that they do not desire to see other lands become as blissful as their own? But wherefore should Middle-earth remain forever desolate and dark, whereas the elves could make it as fair as Erisea, nay, even as Valinor? And since you have not returned thither as you might, I perceive that you love this Middle Earth as I do. Is it not then our task to labor together for its enrichment? 
and for the raising of all the elven kindreds that wander here untaught to the height of that power and knowledge which those have who are beyond the sea. A tale mirrored in Halbrand's raft. So let's take a pause and kind of go in a slightly different direction as we're building on my crazy harebrained conspiracy theory. In episode two, Galadriel finds herself adrift in the middle of the Sundering Seas with a stranger who calls himself Halbrand. Later revealed to be Sauron in disguise, Halbrand represents a Sauron who has been brought low after the defeat of Morgoth. His character outwardly wrestles with his own fate, duty, and power throughout the season. Whether any of that is genuine, I think, remains to be seen and is neither here nor there. Their meeting is described by the showrunners as a Tolkienian chance meeting, which will ultimately shape the future of Middle-earth for better or for worse, as we can see. Now, while they're adrift on their small raft, a great storm suddenly threatens to halt both Sauron and Galadriel's plans. Upon a rewatch of the season, a careful viewer will see that the strongest parallels to the Song of the Roots of the Hithyglir are on display in this scene. Visually, these scenes form a beautiful parallel. Thematically, they serve as a foreboding warning against the Noldor's partnership with Sauron. Like in the song, an elf and a Maya are striving against one another. Galadriel is determined to return to Middle-earth, while Halbrand is attempting to flee. Halbrand recognizes that the wind is too strong, that the raft is falling apart, and he yells that they must tie it together. At the same time, Galadriel begins to tie herself to the beam of a raft. Ultimately, at the height of the storm, Galadriel calls to Halbrand, urging him to bind himself to her, and the beam to which she is tied is immediately struck by lightning, and she is cast into the sea. Here, the lightning is the key, for it is the first crack in the facade of Sauron's lies. In the Song of the Roots of the Hithyglir, the lightning represents a divine intervention which brings these two powers together to form the alloy of Mithril. The strength of both good and evil have been combined through the power of lightning. This union has essentially been given a divine blessing in the form of this lightning. But in the case of Galadriel and Halbrand's raft, the lightning can be instead seen as an act of divine intervention meant to prevent these two powers from joining. Throughout the Silmarillion, wind and lightning often represent an act of intervention coming from the Vala Manwe. And I hope that later in the series, while Sauron is in Numenor, We may see him defy the lightning once more, as he does in the Silmarillion, because I think that would add a lot to this whole idea. Sauron is defying the gods over and over and over. This mirroring tale reaches its culmination in episode 8, when Halbrand is revealed as Sauron, and Sauron enters Galadriel's mind to return the two of them to their raft. Here, now that all lies have been laid bare, he openly pitches this idea of an alloy to her. Just like in the song, Sauron proposes a partnership between his own dark power and Galadriel's light. When this proposal is rejected, Sauron strikes from the right-hand side of the scene as a demonstration of Sauron's wrath and power, and Galadriel is left to drown, and this time Sauron will not save her. Now let's move in another direction as we kind of continue along this crazy web of theory. The Tree of the Knowledge of Good and Evil In light of both Tolkien's religious faith and their religious background of the series showrunner, the similarities between Sauron's manipulation and the story of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as told in the book of Genesis are worth examining. To make a biblical connection, the mithril deception follows the same strategy taken by the serpent in the Garden of Eden. This song, the story of mithril, is an inversion of the story of the Garden of Eden, or perhaps it is the story as if it were told from the serpent's perspective. In an interview with The Hollywood Reporter, showrunner J.D. Payne referenced Adam and Eve in discussion of Sauron's character, likening him to Satan as depicted in Paradise Lost. This quote stood out to me for two reasons. First, it demonstrates that the writers were indeed thinking of the story of Adam and Eve whilst creating Sauron's deception. Second, here they have made clear their intent to deceive the audience alongside their characters. J.D. Payne says, There's something that Milton does in Paradise Lost that we have talked about a lot, where he makes Satan a really compelling character. In some ways, he's the first anti-hero, where he's compelling and you can't take your eyes off of him. Milton did that on purpose because he wants you to follow along with Adam and Eve. He wants Satan to be so persuasive that he also seduces the reader, and you're unconsciously won over, so that you perceive your own fallenness 
and your need for redemption. Both tales recount a tree at the center of conflict between good and evil, albeit in different ways. And when approached from the mind of Sauron, the voice of the deceiver speaks most clearly. Can it be that those in authority are preventing you from prospering? Should we not reach out together and take this gift as our own? Can we not live as the gods themselves? Essentially, the fruit of the Song of the Roots of the Thyglir is Mithril. The mining of Mithril has been deemed too dangerous and is therefore forbidden, and yet the elves have become convinced that they need this new ore. Without it, they are unable to remain in Middle-earth. And yet in the Song, it is good, or necessary even, to take the fruit. The moral is turned on its head, and good is encouraged to touch the darkness. In the biblical narrative, the serpent has convinced Eve that she would not die and would instead become like God, or in the King James Version, ye shall be as gods, were she to eat from the tree. In this analogy, both Celebrimbor and Galadriel may be meant to represent Eve, who takes the story at face value and shares it with the rest of the Noldor, unintentionally bringing about their own fall. While the series chooses to emphasize Galadriel's deception in this season, it is my hope that season two will focus more directly on Celebrimbor's deception as I believe Tolkien intended. Both Oregion and Valinor as Eden. Sauron's confrontation of Galadriel in the gardens of Oregion also calls to mind an image of Eve tempted by the serpent. Perhaps Oregion can be seen in many ways as a type of Garden of Eden. A place of otherworldly beautiful and abundant natural growth is now poisoned by the whispers of deception through which a great fall occurs. In letter 131, Tolkien writes, Sauron found their weak point in suggesting that, helping one another, they could make the western Middle-earth as beautiful as Valinor. It was really a veiled attack on the gods, an incitement to try and make a separate independent paradise. When Sauron enters into Galadriel's mind, she remains physically in a region, but is presented with a vision of Valinor during her childhood, the years of the trees, a place and time which represents in many ways an unfallen world, though this is an imperfect comparison. This is yet another Garden of Eden. Sauron takes upon himself the form of Finrod and leads her to sit beneath a tree where he employs all of his subtlety to sway her. The imagery in this scene is incredibly subtle, which creates an unsettling tone. Sauron appears just as Finrod did in episode one, though things are just slightly different. And as you can see in the video, I think one of my favorite slight little alterations that you might not notice is that um, his hair is kind of parted in the middle, almost as in devil horns, whereas in the first episode, it is not like that at all. Once again, and all at the same time, Eve is tempted by Satan. Galadriel as both Eve and new Eve. While I do feel that Celebrimbor works much better if we are trying to make this into an allegory, season one, for some reason, decided to take Galadriel as the focus. And um, so she kind of represents, in some ways, I think she's meant to be Eve. And then in other ways, she's meant to be a sort of anti-Eve or a new Eve, or Eve redeemed. This theme is further explored in Galadriel's relationship with Sauron throughout the season, and I suspect it will continue throughout the remainder of the series, and we will likely see the same manipulation at work with other characters as well. Like I said, hopefully Celebrimbor, and I'm definitely counting on some interactions between Sauron and Farazhan. In the biblical narrative, Eve is separated from her husband at the time of her temptation, and I believe this is at least maybe one of the reasons that the showrunners chose to remove Galadriel's husband, Celeborn, from her storyline in order to isolate her in this temptation. Were this the case, it would make Celeborn almost into some sort of Adam figure if we're going to kind of see this allegory all the way through. However, Galadriel is both like and unlike Eve. She rejects Sauron's proposal at the end of the season, and yet she also allows the elves to continue in the creation of the Rings of Power. To continue the allegory of Eden, perhaps these rings can also be seen as the forbidden fruit, so she both rejects and accepts him at the same time. Later, I'm assuming in season two, we will see Galadriel accepting her ring, Nenya, knowing full well that its creation and power are tied to Sauron. And it won't be until the end of the Third Age that Galadriel rejects Sauron utterly when offered the ring by Frodo. 
At that point, she has passed the test and she is no longer Eve in a sense, but an anti-Eve or a new Eve, as we might say. So we have a Galadriel who is both fallen and redeemed. And I think that is very aligned with the way that Tolkien wrote about her, especially in her letters and especially when you look at Unfinished Tales. So I really do appreciate, I think, the way that they've portrayed Galadriel has been pretty controversial so far, but I think that they are in general, on the right track with her. As an aside, while we're thinking about Celeborn, if this is the direction that the showrunners are indeed taking Galadriel's character, then we can kind of infer that Celeborn may be depicted as a sort of anti-Adam or new Adam character when he is finally reunited with his wife. He may meet her with understanding and empathy rather than condemnation and blame as Adam does in the biblical narrative. In this case, I'll be super happy and relieved to see how that goes. Celebrimbor the Deceived. So my theory proposes that Sauron himself whispered the song of the roots of the Hithyglir into the hearts of the Noldor long ago, while appearing in a different form. This story must have been in circulation for at least a few hundred years, as indicated by Elrond's awareness of it. It's also possible that the story is a lie passed down from Morgoth, but it seems more aligned with Sauron's philosophy. Sauron, who covets Mithril, has devised an apocryphal tale to encourage Celeborn, the grandson of Feanor, to pursue Mithril by connecting it to a Silmaril. The oath of Feanor is reawakened in his heart as he... <sighs> and he begins to see this new ore as the answer to all of his problems. Sauron could have attempted to manipulate the dwarves directly, but Tolkien writes that he preferred to corrupt the Eldar or the elves. Tolkien writes, For long he paid little heed to the dwarves or men and endeavored to win the friendship and trust of the Eldar. Throughout the early Second Age, the elves had been obsessed with fading, and it's their weakness that becomes Sauron's opportunity to offer them a way out. He sees that they're afraid of fading, and so he says, Well, here, I've got the perfect solution, and um, he's going to use that to master them. In an interview with Vanity Fair, J.D. Payne says, in the fourth episode, Galadriel asks him, Sauron, for advice, and he says basically, the way you beat your enemies is to figure out what they need and figure out how to give it to them. Help them master their fear, and then you can master them. And that's exactly what he's doing to her the entire season. Maybe what he's going to do to everybody over the following seasons. Elf Lords only, Sauron and Linden? Now, interwoven with this theory is also my belief that Sauron may have been present at the Elf Lords Only meeting referred to in episode one. Here, he would have appeared in a different form to propose collaboration with the Noldor, but was rejected. Sauron, having grown impatient after his rejection, or maybe his feelings are just hurt, hastens their apparent fading by poisoning their great tree on the way out, somehow. The seed that had been planted in Celebrimbor's mind is now bearing fruit and Sauron's plans are now in motion. This is also likely connected to Galadriel's pursuit of Sauron, though I don't want to venture off in this direction quite yet. The Power Over the Flesh In episode 6, Adar explains that Sauron had been seeking a power over the flesh, but had yet to succeed in his experiments. Perhaps Sauron believes that Mithril is the key to his craft. While in truth, Mithril is not connected to the Silmarils in any way, it does contain this magical quality, at least it does in the show's canon. When placed near a leaf in Linden's great tree, the leaf's sickness is immediately cast away. I do think it's interesting, though, that when the elves had the Mithril while they were in Linden, they didn't notice any sort of healing among the tree or even attempt it. I'm not quite sure why. Um, but maybe that'll be explained later too. It can also be suggested that the Malorn tree growing in Casa Doom is thriving because of its close proximity to the mithril deposits in the mountain. Now, I don't totally know what's going on with that, and that's another thing that I hope will be explained as we move forward. The timing of the arrival of the stranger via meteor is also worth noting. It is my belief that he is meant to be Gandalf, though we'll have to wait and see, and that he was sent to by the Valar as they sensed Sauron's power beginning to stir. While this doesn't quite work with Tolkien's timeline for the Second Age, we know that we are working with a compressed or more accurately reorganized timeline for the Rings of Power, so it seems generally plausible within their framework. The Elven Rings Ultimately, 
The final alloy we are presented with in season one is the forging of the elven rings. This is seen most obviously through the actual forging in which they have coaxed the mithril to join with the other ores, but it is also seen in Celebrimbor's partnership with Halbrand. Once again, I hope the relationship between Anatar and Celebrimbor will be explored more fully in the future, as it was really super neglected in season one, uh, much to the detriment of, I think, the whole story, honestly. Can I say that? So after all of that, after I've made myself look like a total crazy person talking about this for 30 minutes, will season two bring answers? Ultimately, the origin of the song of the roots of the Hithyglir may never be revealed. It is my hope that season two will confirm my theory that Sauron is indeed the craftsman of the stale, but as it stands, we have no choice but to wait and see. Until then, I'm really enjoying theorizing with all of you, though. If you'd like to connect to chat about this or other Rings of Power theories, you can find me on Twitter or Discord. In truth, I feel pretty good about my theory, and I just wanted to get it out there into the world before we begin season two promo, because if I am right, I'm going to feel super, super smart. And if I'm wrong, I had a lot of fun. I think, you know, what if the real Mithril origin story was the friends we made along the way? So either way, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about this, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. So shoot me a message or leave a comment um, and we can keep chatting about this. My heartfelt thanks to all of the wonderful folks within the OneRing.net Discord and the Fellowship of Fans Discord for their time as we've been kind of working through all of these stories and theories that I've had bouncing around in my head for the last year. Especially want to thank Webcrawler and Dr. Nosy. I also really, really enjoyed a couple different pieces that I've read of analysis on the Rings of Power, and I'm going to link to them below. There is a really cool blog called Beyond Darkness um, that goes super in-depth with a lot of different things relating to Sauron especially. There is also a wonderful discussion of Sauron and Galadriel in relation to Adam and Eve by Gil Estelle's Canvas on Twitter, so I'll link to that as well. And then uh, Beric the Horse has a great discussion of Celebrimbor and the Dwarves on Twitter as well. So all of those links and the links to the various interviews with the showrunners will be in the description. Thanks so much for watching me make a fool of myself theorizing about these uh, this crazy show that I seem to love so much. Um, I will see you all soon, hopefully for some more uh, Tolkien book related content. Thanks for watching. Thank you.